Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Krista and Ed show. Ed here. Krista. We're so excited today. We have Rob Sales here, who is uh, hails from England and uh, has taken the time uh, to be interviewed today. He's a musician, a marketing strategist, a TEDx speaker. He's been in digital marketing since 1996, so he's seen a lot of things come, a lot of things go, and we're super excited to have you today, Rob. So welcome. Thank you very much for coming. No, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I've been very excited about actually jumping in and, and chatting with you guys. Yeah, great. So tell us, I mean, before the interview started, you were talking about all of the trends of things that have come and gone, and there's some kind of basic principles. And I thought, oh, man, we should have been recording that. So <laughs> kind of delve back in that direction. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like there's been YouTube's come and – all of these different platforms, obviously social media, but there are some principles that really are the basics when it comes to digital marketing. So I'm hoping that you would, would chat about that a bit. Yeah. So I suppose it kind of ties in with my background as well. So, I mean, you can tell from the instruments that are hanging behind me, I'm, I'm a musician as well as anything else. <clears throat> um, back in 96, when I was finishing my final year of my degree, there was a tiny little module that was inserted and it was called the internet. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I, <laughs> what, it, what is this? And I remember talking to my tutor and my tutor saying, Oh, it's going to be amazing. You're going to be able to like these videos that you're making and this music that you're producing, you're going to be able to put it on the internet and other people are going to be able to see it all over the world. And I'm just thinking, you're an idiot. No, no way. I don't get what you're talking about. But it, it spawned my career. Um, I was so fascinated by this idea that you could connect with other people all over the world and share experiences and share content, that kind of stuff. It sucked me in. It really, really did. I spent probably 10, 15 years working every single different discipline of, of digital agency life that you could you could possibly think of and i've seen things like the birth of ebay and the birth of amazon and the birth of youtube and the emergence of crazy thing called wi-fi like before then we were all using dial-up modems that used to take forever and you couldn't download anything because it took too long and so many things have like accelerated and accelerated you know using the internet on a a desktop because smartphones didn't exist. I sound like such a crazy old dinosaur. Um, and it's true. I probably am. I, I've seen lots and lots and lots of changes. And, and as you say, some things have come and some things have gone, but there are like some fundamental things that still remain. Some things that I guess inspired me to even get involved in the industry in the first place. The idea of connecting with other people and sharing experiences and building communities and, and having human relationships, whether it's kind of nurturing from a business point of view, nurturing relationships with potential customers and then becoming your clients or whether it's just being involved in social media and, and building communities. There are kind of fundamental things that have always been the same. And that comes down to the fact that there's a human here and there's humans there yeah. And we're communicating with each other using some kind of technology, whether we're just chatting and building a relationship or whether we're selling things to each other. Um, it's never changed. It's just that some fads and some platforms and some brands and some technologies come and go. But some of the fundamentals, I think, are always going to be there. And I think these days, a lot of businesses forget that. They get so lost in using a particular platform or using a particular piece of software or doing advertising or social media in a particular way, they forget about the fundamental thing, which is that there's a human being hanging off the other end of the connection and you need to, you need to build rapport with people. Which is the most important piece, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Know, at the end of the day and you're so right. And once you, once you know that, and I mean, for you being, in that industry or seeing those patterns for so long, I'm sure it's clear as day for you, right? If you can clearly see it. I know that we're, we kind of do that as well. It's like, we know, okay, this, this, is, this is what you need or this is the other piece and it all should be working together at the end of the day, keeping 
that human being <laughs> or relationship in mind, right? So like if you're, if you're doing, let's say like digital marketing, whatever that is, right? It's like your, your, your email marketing or however it is that you're nurturing that relationship to, you know, to, to bring them in. But yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think it's interesting to talk about that because I just think of a lot of clients or businesses that I've interacted with and I've had an agency for the better part of 10 years and someone's like, just put the, put somebody on the Facebook and just push stuff out. And they're really not engaging. They're not yeah. thinking this through and going, who is that, you know, ideal person that they want to create a relationship with. It's more about just pushing content out and not really thinking of it from it's that like point of view. It's like talking to nobody. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's a lot of that. It, it's almost like before the dot com bubble and the big crash, I remember working in agencies when like literally, literally you would have a chat with a potential client as an agency and they would say, we want a website. We want a domain name. Well, what do you want one for? Oh, because everyone else has got one. And it's like everyone just wanted a domain name and a website for the sake of it. But it's still it's, happening. Well, it's you know, what, what, what are you going to use it for? What, what's, what's the put? Oh, we just want to, you know, put content out there. And it's like, well, is that adding value? Are you, you know, are you positioning yourself? Or are you making people understand something a little bit more? Are you giving away free hints and tips? No, no, we just want to put content out there. And think, <laughs> This is just such a waste of time and money. Yeah. You know? I know, I know. Yeah. And I think that there, there probably are a, a layer of businesses or people that have had gone through that experience where they've bought the domain name, they bought the website, they've created a social, like a Facebook page or whatever it may be, and then they just kind of push some content out and then two or three years later, they're like, we never well, really got anything working. from this. Yeah. You know? So... Uh, I think I think what a lot of that comes down to as well, um, and it's difficult to have a conversation with a business that behaves that way, but it comes down to vanity and ego. Um, you know, people putting stuff out there and being really excited by by getting likes or getting followers, and it's like that's just a vanity metric. That's not really a metric of of anything useful. That that you know. You're not necessarily getting more business or people aren't more engaged. It's just mm -hmm. a, a random click or a number. Um, and the same thing with putting content out there that's talking about yourself and talking about the features. That's quite an egotistic thing. You kind of want to be more focused on creating value for other people or showing people benefits and outcomes of working with you. It, it's, it, it, it comes again, comes down to just creating relationships with people and making yeah making people's lives slightly easier and slightly better through whatever action you choose to take. Yeah. You know, it was funny. Somebody said the other day, I think it was uh, one of our, someone that we do work with in the U S and they were talking about likes and they're like, you know, in Canada, cause we're from Canada, uh, we're very polite. So if people push stuff out. You, you just, you feel this all like, I, I have to like it. You know what I mean? And again, that, that talk, that's just an example from a social our society perspective where you're being polite but there's no real commitment there's no relationship building there's no you know it's not leading to sales <laughs> I don't just like things because i'm canadian but people do the, oh, they okay. do they're like oh okay My i like friend, that i, guess, I like yeah, that yeah. i like that but it's not yeah. really a, a test to you know okay i'm gonna buy that or commit to doing whatever it is no but it, it's an interesting first step and psychologically when you look at like traditional sales and marketing there's that whole thing that law of um, reciprocation and if you're creating value and constantly giving away some of the best things in your business you know hints and tips and advice and ideas and that kind of thing people feel over time like at some point they want to reciprocate because you've given them something for free yeah. Yeah. and and that's psychologically quite a good um framing process to actually go through so it's kind of like one step beyond just liking something for the sake of it it's so easy with smartphones and, and the way that tech has like immersed itself into our lives to just press like and and, oh, yeah. and love on something and and you know it's almost like it just washes over you and you click something for the sake of it but if as a business you can take it to the next level and build value and give something away then the law of reciprocation starts to kick in and people start to actually feel like they owe you something. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, that's actually a really good thought to think about, right? When you're when you're doing whatever the presentations are, or whatever you're. Yeah, I like that. That's pretty cool. I mean, we try to do that, right? We've been working on pushing out more content where it's literally here's some great tips, here's some great ways or strategies to do something, and having that ability to to learn, and then you're building a relationship. So yeah, yeah. Well, it's once you kind of understand you know, what you're using the, whatever platform it is, what the purpose is, right. And who you're wanting to engage. I know with, with my boutique, like I would say that all the time because people, you know, they'd see, I got really good at the engagement piece, right. And, and getting people to interact, but I kind of used it as a pilot project for a couple of years to just figure this whole online thing out. So I would get, you know, like, 300 likes on a pair of boots and like 2000 comments and people are thinking that I just like hit the lottery at home. Right. And I'm like, you guys, I might've sold three pairs out of that. You don't understand. It's like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, not that I would say that, but it would just make me laugh. Cause I'm like, people just, they don't understand that that doesn't equate to sales. There's more to it. No. And it's a bit of a funny one and it's really hard to tell. I mean, an example through, some of my social media accounts, the pages that we have in the group that we run, um, there have been three clients recently that have you know, come to us and onboarded and wanted various services. And one of them, he said, oh, I've, I've been watching your content for ages and you know, I've learned some things about marketing and you made me think about some things and now I'm, you know, I need some help, I need some consultation and I'd like to actually get you to do some stuff. And I, I said, who the hell are you? And he's, he's like, Oh, I've been watching your content. And I said, but you've not engaged with anything for 18 months. You've not even liked no, a piece of content. So you can never underestimate the lurkers. You know, there may be people there in your groups or on your pages or people that open your email but don't click on something that are actually just not judging you, but they're, they're letting content wash over them. And sooner or later, they'll come to a point where it's like, I want to work with you because you've just triggered something in me. I got to tell you, I'm a bit of a lurker too. Like you probably had that same thought with me. Who the hell are you? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I also, I mean, I'm more, I do observe, but I also understand how it all works. So I'm always very like, I'm not, I want to click on this, but I'm not going to, because I know I'm going to get retargeted. <laughs> like sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the wacky world of digital marketing. Yeah. Yes. It's like that paranoia. I'm like, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then when they don't retarget me, I'm like, what are you doing? You're wasting your, you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. But you know, psychologically, like if you're like, there's a respect factor when this, client was looking at all your content and watching it and relating to it and learning from it. Yeah. But <clears throat> you never know what triggers somebody to make that jump, to jump over into your right. ocean, right? Where they're like, okay. Uh, and it could be, you know, in fact, I've talked to some clients about this from a business development perspective. It's like, how many touch points do you need mm -hmm. to, or how much goodwill do you have to put out to keep, you know, uh, pushing forward to finally getting a closed proposal, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, so when we're pushing content out, you don't know what's going to trigger somebody. Yeah. So you're right. There's tons of people that are, I guess, lurkers or they're just people that are observing, but not really engaged. And then all of a sudden something, some piece of content that you've put out that triggers, they're like, no, this is the tipping point. There's so much value here. This makes sense. And of course, they're also drawn to you. Yeah, yeah. drawn to you. That, that kind of attraction. Yeah, and I, I, th I think part of this kind of comes down to strategy. Um, and, and that almost comes back to what we were saying about before, about you know, uh, uh, being about other people. If, if you're talking to a particular sort of audience and you know who that audience is, you've defined a, a profile of your ideal client and you know how they think and what they like and what their common pain points are. You can build a content strategy, which actually over time touches on some of those pain points and introduces some solutions. So you can, to a greater or lesser extent, as you start to put content out there, you know that you might not get engagement, but you know at a certain point in time, you will probably touch on something that will make people react. And when they react, they will 
you know, engage. They'll either reach out and say, I need your help, or they'll say, that's great, I didn't think of that, or they say, no, I completely disagree, or whatever. But knowing who it is that you're talking to helps you kind of work out what to say rather than just randomly splatting content out there. You can actually yeah. start to build rapport and start to nurture the relationship just simply by putting content out. Um, but you do need to know really what the, the kind of common genetic makeup of the audience is. And then you can obviously craft your content and your message around that audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, um, you know, some of the things I also wanted to talk to you about is, Oh, you have a question, honey. Oh, we always have questions. Here. We've done this a million yeah, times. Come on it. <laughs> so how do you manage like work life balance? Like you're, you work, you have your virtual agency, your home. So how do you manage that? And, like the balance of it. I know like for instance, Krista works, likes to work late at night. I'm an early guy. I wake up at five in the morning typically. Like how do you balance it? And I think you mentioned something about Fridays and how you juggle things. So yeah. So I kind of from 96 for about 20 years, I, I worked in agency. So I was employed and then I went and did a big corporate gig for about eight years doing digital strategy stuff all along. I was running a little freelance agency as well. Yeah. Um, and about three years ago, I took redundancy. I'd just had enough of the corporate. I thought, I need to go and do it myself. And I thought, yeah, it's going to be so easy running a business. And lo and behold, it was incredibly painfully hard. Um, growing up, this is my kind of why. And this leads, I guess, to how I operate now. Um, my dad was a real workaholic, like crazy workaholic. Um, I wouldn't see him very much. And when I did, he was always angry because he was just stressed out about work. So really, I kind of grew up without a dad, um, which was really hard, not having a, a male figure there. And I guess I made a promise to myself that I would never become my dad. I would never become an alcoholic. He got cancer a few years ago. And for those last three months of his life, we became incredibly close and he was, you know, he, he kind of realized all the things that he'd done to us and to himself and all the rest of it. And we, we put a lot of things to rest, but I realized when I started my own business three years ago that I was like, after about two years, I was effectively be becoming exactly what I didn't want to become, which was a crazy workaholic driven by the business, not seeing the family, you know, stressed out and all the rest of it. So I took up some mentorship last year and just ripped myself apart and I ripped the business apart and I realized that I was just like a glorified freelancer just working crazy hours I repositioned the business I built a virtual team around me you know experts all over the globe I, I kind of drew on my studio management experience to to harness a team still being able to rubber stamp and quality control and project manage stuff but not actually doing it all myself so now, although I do get up early because we've got a little puppy over here that loves to get up at five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> I've got more controlled hours because I'm, I'm kind of steering projects with, with my, my team. I take Fridays off um, to spend time with the nephews and it's not perfect. I'm still like undoing some of my intrinsic behaviors that I kind of learned growing up Mm -hmm. from dad but i'm acutely aware of what the triggers are and and how it can affect you running a business and just becoming an absolute workaholic you know looking for certain signs of stress and either forcing time off or thinking of better ways to become more efficient automate certain processes outsource certain things mm -hmm. um just to be the best version of me for myself, for the family and for the business. I think when you do find balance, it sounds crazy, maybe a bit woo woo, but everything starts to flow. As soon as you start to fall apart, everything falls apart. But when you're in a good place and you're in a, a kind of sense of flow, yeah. the confidence and the energy just moves everywhere. So it's really important to look after yourself and, and, and not become well, for me, not become my dad, basically. Yeah. 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 
yeah that's uh that's something to we struggle with that like i'm uh like like when you're talking about like the freelancer like getting in the middle and the thick of things i i'm terrible for that i like we'll be working on an account for a client in, in let's say google adwords or whatever i just get drawn into the data and everything and just go down a rabbit trail and and Chris is very much the like, okay, wait a minute. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Well, I purpose would, your time. I look at the big picture. I'm also very like, you know, aware of time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the value of your time and that kind of stuff where he's like, oh no, I'll do it. And I'm like, you're, no, oh my God, you're working for minimum wage right now. It's what a little bit of yes to everything. I'm bad about that. Yeah, I've been trying to, you know, but you know, we're in a funny place too. Like, not funny place, but he's only been really home working from home now for like two months. Yeah. Right. He, he went every day to the office and had, had all my the, briefcase, if, if, you know, all the staff and everybody around him too. Yeah. So it's a little bit different, like for him to start to adjust to this whole thing. Yeah. Maybe you could give us, give me some advice. I mean, about I've that. been doing like it I went for from a while. literally, you know, the routine, get up at five in the morning, go to the office with the team and everything. And now I'm home. So sometimes I'm a little bit like, oh. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the same. That, that, that doorway there, yeah. um, that like leads out into our house. You know, I'm, I'm literally in, in the office, which is a virtual studio that I run the entire business from. And there's guys dotted all over the globe that work with me. But I really struggle sometimes, like remembering that when I walk out of that door frame, that's my home. When I walk in here, it's my work. So I use the door frame as a reference, like switch your brain off. But sometimes I struggle. Sometimes my phone is notifying me. Sometimes I haven't resolved the problem and I carry it with me. And I remember my wife saying a few weeks ago, and this is when I kind of went, whoa, hang on a minute, you're becoming your dad again. Because my wife, she's like, oh yeah, we went out for the day. You know, it was really great, but you weren't there. And I'm like, mm. yes, I was. I remember driving to the beach and we went out for a meal and, and she's like, She's like, no, you weren't there. You were absent. You were locked in your head yep. thinking about other things. And I, I think part of it is working on some kind of productivity and focus thing. Part of it is gratitude and meditation. Part of it is time boxing. Part of it is letting go and, and sometimes going, you know what? I know this guy that I've hired is not going to be as good as me, but I have to trust that he will get as good as me. But if I keep interfering, I'm just going to keep jumping down that rabbit hole and wasting all my time. And this guy's never going to grow. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just kind of giving yourself time to step back every hour or so and just see whether you're actually kind of doing the right things or not. But Jesus, I mean, I've made so many terrible mistakes and I still will. Um, but I'm becoming more aware of them, I guess. Yeah. And I'm going to say the last part of it is listen to your wife. Yeah. <laughs> yes. See, he knows. He knows no, she's going to be no, like. No, so here's here's the thing. I, I spent. <laughs> he agrees. Listen. Yeah, yeah. I, I spent five grand uh, a few years ago on a training program, which was all about like how to position yourself, how to use LinkedIn for lead prospecting, how to blah 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 blah. And it was cookie cutter. And I realized that I bought something, one, because I thought it was a silver bullet, and two, because I believed in the outcomes. And both of them were garbage. It was like a, cut, a cookie cutter solution that couldn't have worked for me because I didn't know what I wanted. But I remember my daughter out in the hallway taking a picture of me wearing a suit, like looking all smart. And I looked at myself and I'm like, yes, this will be great for my LinkedIn profile. Everyone will think I'm such a cool guy. And I'm thinking... In the back of my head, I'm thinking, but I look exactly like I used to when I used to work in corporate. I look uncomfortable and gray. And my wife saying to me, what are you doing? You're an idiot. Why did you spend all that money? Like, you I really could... like your wife. <laughs> yeah, she's great. She's, she's like a barometer. But I, it's a weird thing. You, you either have to have that other better person inside your own head or you have to have a coach or a mentor, or you have to have a wife or a husband, or you have to have a business. You kind of need other people around you to every now and again just go, I think you just jumped down a rabbit hole. Careful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, well, I don't know where our squirrel is, but yeah. We oh, have we have one. a squirrel here. But yeah. you know, it's funny just like how you identify. Like I worked in um, the corporate world for 15 years before mm -hmm. I decided to stay home and jump on this entrepreneurship thing. So it was actually the utility industry, but IT uh, area. And once I left the corporate world, I remember really struggling a little bit with my identity. So I know yeah. what you're talking about because it almost becomes what sort of defines you subconsciously, right? And it's like, okay, wait, like who, like who am I again? And same with him right before this interview. I'm like, you have to just go on and tell him I'll be down in five minutes. He's like, where's my suit jacket, right? Because he's so used to, you. <laughs> like I swear to God. So just, I related to what you just said and I'm like, I just wear my oiler shirt. Doesn't matter. Like we're just people talking, right? Yeah. But but I mean, I'm like, you know, how many years now? Five years out of that, and I've started yeah. to be like, you know what? It's way more comfortable for me to be myself. I love being myself, and guess what? Like it, people relate to that more. Attracts you, right? authenticity. Right? Not, not, yeah, I completely not, agree. Not saying, not saying that dressing that way wasn't yourself, but it's a weird thing that you go through on. Like, okay, wait, like who am I? What am I supposed to do? Like the first mm -hmm. day that you work week, you started working from home. I feel like you even put your suit on just because it was like, that was the routine. right? Well, I, I, I would step back here. I, I have a uncle in the jewelry trade and I worked for him for a short period of time. Uh, kind of when I became an entrepreneur, when I started my own kind of storyline as to, you know, small businesses and I've had a couple over the years. So I worked for him for a short period of time and he was beating it into me. He's like, in the morning when you get up, put on your suit, get your tie on, it's business, go to your office, close the door, don't let the kids in, don't let anybody in, get in there, right? That was what he was coaching me. He's like, if you wanna work from home and be a, you know, uh, have an agency in that business, you, you uh, that's what you do, right? And so- But it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because the reason why people do that <clears throat> when you think about it fundamentally is like confidence. You know, people, there are the two, well, two reasons, I guess. One is that the education system and the employment system is geared in such a way that we all exist in cubicles and we all have a function. Yeah. And we're all meant to lock into each other. There's like, there's no bleed. There's no, you know, massive originality. We're just part of a system. And it's quite difficult when you step out of that system to then recalibrate. But when you think about why people get dressed up or power dress, you know, men and women, it's actually just for confidence. And there are other ways that you can get confidence. And, and sometimes that's just being your like genuine, authentic self. I'm absolutely covered in tattoos. I've been for years. I used to power dress in suits, but I would be very careful in corporate board meetings to make sure this was all covered up because it was frowned on. Mm -hmm. I was still a great person at my job, yeah. but there's that whole, you know, interpretation of a person's capability based on how they appear, yeah. um, which is crazy. I understand it, but it's crazy. But yeah, yeah. When, when you start to learn to be your authentic self, a great thing happens. Yeah. You either naturally repel people, who don't need to be in your life or you magnetize people. And it's as simple as that. I think that even leads to, you know, when you know your why and where you're going, that you weed out, you're weeding out people that are just not a fit. And I go back to my agency days and we would take anything, right? It's like, yes, we said yes to everything. Yeah. And in some cases you did it because you were like, okay, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, demands financially, revenue, expense, you know, to run that big machine. Um, but, and you go, well, we can do this work, but is it really fit with where we want to go, what we want to do? And I think that's where I struggled for a long time is going, man, this is just not, it's a, it's a grind. It's not, it's not about fulfill, fulfillment. It's obviously we did great work for clients and I'm happy doing that. But uh, when you're talking about that, it's great. It's made me kind of, chew on it even more it's like oh yeah yeah i mean I, I i i got some examples like literally in this past week okay. one client has let us go and we've let a client go and i realized looking back it's because we didn't qualify each other we like they needed something quick we needed some cash flow through the business you know i was behaving in a 
you know, a kind of legacy way, just as an agency, just, you know, get clients on board without really thinking about the sustainability of, of the relationship. And it's difficult, um, especially if you're transitioning from one thing to another, or if you've got financial demands or, you know, goals that you want to reach or milestones that you want to hit. But I found more and more learning to be patient, learning to go through that pain, actually working with the right kind of people, things will turn out good. Things will happen that will allow you to land on your feet. It's just probably one of the biggest things I've learned running a business is actually to persevere and like trust that things will work out if you just keep doing what you need to do. Sometimes it can be terrifying because you might be looking at, at bills or losses or whatever and thinking, oh my God, you know, but you're not going to die. No. Well, you're, you're very unlikely to die. <laughs> <laughs> but, do you know what I mean? And, and it, it's that's, kind of framing things in the right way that's really important. Yeah. I, who, who did we listen to? They were talking about that. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? Okay, this. And then what's the worst thing from that? And like starting to break that down and going, okay, well, there's really... You know. I mean, I think like you said, at the, and it does, it all goes back to relationships and the beginning is important to, to qualify, right? To be fair to, to both parties, really, right? Um, and I mean, to me anyways, it's may, way more rewarding to actually be able to, you know, help the, the clients from the perspective of, you know, the whole picture as well. And you're not being uh, stretched thin. They're not, you know what I mean? And, and actually hit that end result or whatever it is. But yeah, I'll, like, I'll I'd, I'd rather go deep with like 10 clients than have, you know, 50 that I can only give little pieces to, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And, and, you know, my, <clears throat> my dream is to have, you know, clients that are with us for for many, many, many years to be able to invite clients over for Christmas dinner, you know, to really, really know them inside out, to see the impact of what we do on their actual lives, you know, for them to say, I've had the first holiday yes. in three years, you know, here's a photo of the kids on the beach. You don't get that if you've got a very loose client relationship, but if you are a great fit, you know, effectively you become partners and, 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 that's where the real human relationships happen. Yeah, awesome. I think that's something that uh, I uh, I'm good at, uh, good at and bad at is that I think a lot of the clients over the years, it's like I have lots of it, and you get that emotional attachment, and you're, you know what I mean. You've said yes to everything, and then once you have that relationship, you're there's where the spreading thin comes. So I think the pre the pre qualifying, like, is this a good fit realistically for both of us? Yeah. So that you can move forward and build that relationship is a great concept. Just listen to me every single day. Oh my gosh. Like today, it's like, just listen to me. No, I'm telling me. you. <laughs> like you should have started 10 years ago, but it's okay. We'll start now. It's all right. It's, yeah. to it's hard. Today. It's hard. <laughs> so quick, yeah. I, have, I have a question for you. I'm curious to know, what is your superpower? Oh, Apart from being British and Northern, I, I found more and more because like 80% of our client base and strategic partners are based in the States. And the more people that I speak to in the States, they're like, you've got such a cool accent. And I think, you know, it's one of those things until people point it out, you don't realize that you, you carry this thing. Um, so apart from my accent, I would probably say being a big thinker, yeah. um, using the experience that I've got to actually see the big picture. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a hard thing. You can get in the grind and into the nitty gritty and not really be going with purpose in the right direction. I think that's a great superpower to have. Yeah. So do you have a question for us? Maybe something you want to throw a curveball at us? What is going to happen? What, what, where, where are you going in the next six months? What's the plan in the next six months? Well, besides uh, world domination. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, some of the things that you've touched on here, I, I think galvanizing who our ideal clients are and then that strategy part. I mean, we have a good idea, but um, honing in on that. And we do have like a group of clients uh, from what I've done from our previous agency 
but our direction is is going this way and making sure that it's everything's a really good fit. So I think that would be a good. So good my thing direction. To say. <laughs> <laughs> listen to her. Listen to her. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. Like, all, like total transparency. We're also sorting all of that out right now, right? Like half of the other business is. So So, things are still kind of all over with some of our other businesses. Um, But you know what? Yeah, right now we're sorting out our clients. But also, you know, I think we're wanting to move into the direction of, you know, being able to do some more like coaching and business development and stuff with businesses, right? Because we do have experience in that, but also with, you know, our marketing and digital marketing and all that kind of stuff. I think Mm -hmm. that with our combined, um, you know, experiences that we have a lot to offer in that sense. Um, but then also keeping our, and building, rebuilding, let's say our, our team, right. To have like a virtual Mm -hmm. team and, you know, some in-house type people type of stuff to be able to actually serve our, serve those clients as well. Um, yeah. So we're kind of working through all of that stuff right now. Um, I think letting go too, like you just, you had said we that don't you went wanna, to that point we, of we, letting we, go and having people that are doing certain parts of the work for you. Cause I'm a, it, it's weird cause kind of business sustainability to me. And it was a mentor that's, that said to me, like, get the hell out of your own way. It, you know, if, if you want to be a family man, if you want to retire or exit or, go and get another business. You've yeah. got to get out of your business's way. And, and that means planning for that. That might be bringing new people in or whatever. But when you think about it, it creates sustainability. It gives you more kind of oh, sense of freedom. You give that back to the family, to your wife, you better half and up. And the whole world suddenly becomes a rosier place. Yeah. Yeah. Like we don't, we don't want to rebuild what we've already built if that makes sense right well i'm I'm, we've learned from literally what do they say when you cycle too it's like okay now you you've kind of seen and you know just through the changes as well um i mean we've been approached by different you know people and businesses wanting to you know have us kind of on as their marketing you know directors and whatnot so we've we've been toying around with the idea as well as going in and helping businesses set up their own separate, you know, agency that the only client is that business. Their in-house agency, basically. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love that. I mean, twenty percent of my time is white labeled to other digital agencies. Yeah. I go in and I act as a independent consultant to either help them internally sort out operations or sort out their client projects. Like, yeah. if you can, if you've got great experience with that, then. A, a portion of your your time a portion of your income could be just going and consulting and and leading other businesses getting that sorted out i love that yeah so um yeah and then ed well sounds like you're going to be an employee doing the work no, <laughs> no but she's i'll she's, rewrite your job this has been a great interview and a good perfect timing because that's something that we've been talking about she's like do you want to do this day-to-day hour by hour work that you're doing or no we have to drive we need to drive it forward and i just there's a skill set and yeah yeah. you know what um i've got it all figured out don't you agree (laughs) yay all right (laughs) no it's a great question and sorry we're stumbling on it only because we are still you know getting on the same page and and figuring that all out, right? Like, it's funny in, in business, like, do you ever know the answer? No, you don't. That's the cool thing about it, too, is you get to ride that wave and make the decisions when they come and try this and did it work and did it not. And, you know. Um, I'd also say, <clears throat> it's fascinating we're talking about this, but, you know, when you have a client coming with the same questions um, to, you know, to you, and you're so it's so easy to offer them solutions and direction and consulting and and help them but when it comes to your yourself and and uh, self-examination and it's like you can't see the trees through the forest sometimes or you're trying oh to- god absolutely i mean it I, I i do with my team we do high ticket funnels um yeah. our own funnel yeah only just finished after a year um, our own documentation, our own proposition, our own signature systems. You know, we do this for other clients. It's a little bit like a parent's bedroom. 
most parents' bedrooms are the last room in the house to get decorated. It's like, look after everything else first. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the same running a business, I think, sometimes. It's like the advice and the support yeah. and the service that you give your clients. You know you need to do yourself, but it's always the last thing to get done. Well, and that's where I think like that pain point is and where we can actually come in and help businesses because so many times people come to us and they're like, we know we need to be doing this, but we're, we're not. Or they just don't even know where to start, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thank you, Rob. We appreciate your time today to chat with us. Absolutely. No, it's been so cool. I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been great. Awesome. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes. Bye. <laughs>